Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's ProSound Web webinar, Wireless Apocalypse or Hype, What You Need to Know About the Future of RF for Professional Audio. I'm your moderator, Keith Clark, editor of ProSound Web and Live Sound International. Our presenter today is noted wireless and RF consultant, James Staffo. Before we get started, here are a couple of uh, things you need to know. Uh, how to participate, audio options, turn on the volume on your computer to join the audio broadcast during an event, choose join audio broadcasting on the communicate menu, and uh, dial in to our teleconference line. You can see the numbers there in the passcode. And if you're having any difficulty with WebEx, the system, uh, please contact the technical support at the number below, 866-229-3239. How to ask questions. Uh, you can uh, submit your questions via the Q&A area in the bottom right area of your screen. And to ask about technical issues, please use the chat area in the middle right area of your screen. And uh, again, if you're having trouble uh, with anything, call that uh, tech support number. All righty. Uh, again, our uh, panelist is uh, James Staffo. And I am Keith Clark, editor of ProSound Web and Live Sound. And without further ado, we're going to uh, turn this over to James for today's webinar. Go ahead, James. Hey, thanks, Keith. Well, good day, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you uh, for joining us today on the ProSound Web for what I hope will be an um, interesting and enlightening discussion for about the next hour or so, particularly for those of us that depend on wireless microphones, intercoms, IFBs, and uh, in-ear monitors in our daily activity. Um, Keith has asked me, kind enough to ask me to, to do a couple of these, and in the past, my opening statement usually is something to the effect of that we're going through greater changes now in the spectrum, which we've called home, than in the history of wireless operations on this planet. And it felt true every time I said it, first with the uh, digital television transition and then with the auctioning off of the, the, the infamous 700 meg auction, which is actually the 698 and above meg auction. Well, the next wave is about to hit us this year, and it will be continually more and more congested as time goes on, and we're going to explain exactly why. Here are some of the things we'll talk about today is where wireless microphones, intercoms, uh, in-ear monitors, and IFB systems live now, and what could happen in the future. These are already laws that Congress has passed and the FCC is implementing, so this is done deals, and we'll talk about exactly what those changes are, specifically the digital transition and the introduction of what we see here as white space devices. However, this is the last time that I will call them white space devices, and I'll explain exactly why. <clears throat> Since we're in such a, a condition in the world right now, I, I know I've been doing this for about 30 years, and it's getting more and more difficult to operate large numbers of wireless systems. It used to be pretty easy. You'd write a, a couple of frequencies on a dart and throw it at the dartboard, and you usually could come out okay. Well, those days are long gone. Now it takes extreme planning and all types of tips and tricks that we'll talk about to maximize your chances uh, for success. In addition, their manufacturers have seen what's happening, what these FCC changes are, and we've responded uh, with different types of modulation schemes. We've introduced um, digital wireless and things. We'll talk about how the manufacturers have responded to this ongoing challenge. We'll then spend a little bit of time talking about a future auction, which has already been approved. And then finally, because of all this additional spectral congestion, I'm going to point out a few affordable and not so affordable radio spectrum analyzers, because we can't see RF, so we have to rely on some type of tool to be able to do our jobs. And I'll, I have a, a host from, from the low end to the extremely high end on what can be your eyes and ears to the radio realm. So let's take a look at where wireless microphones have operated since their introduction in the United States. Well, we have shared our spectrum with television broadcasters. We've done so in coordination and cooperation with television broadcasters. And the majority of the wireless systems on the market, that would be, again, wireless mics, 
intercoms, IFB, and in-ear monitors, what the FCC refers to as low-power auxiliary devices. For the, for the most part, we have operated in the television band you see on your screen there, TV2 through, at the time, it was channel 69. Uh, well, the first thing that happened a few years ago was analog television began to shut down in favor of digital television, and we'll take a look at that in a minute. But let me look at, let me talk about what you've seen before you for a second here. The majority of systems today operate in the UHF band from channel 14 through 51. Back in 2009, they were able to operate all the way up to 806 megahertz. Well, that infamous 700 megahertz auction that I mentioned took away fully one-third of the radio spectrum that we have used since the introduction of wireless systems in 1962. So the first crunch had to do with uh, digital television introduction, and then the second crunch for us had to do with the 700 megahertz auction where we lost the top one-third of the spectrum that we've grown used to since we've been in this business. Producers and people who are responsible for you know, specifying the number of mics and comms really aren't aware of the fact that we've had to crunch more and more equipment into less and less spectrum. So production companies, producers, corporate theater, and so forth expects that we should be able to pack the same amount of equipment not knowing that we really have one-third less space to do so in. You'll see also on the, on the top right, there's a red line over television band 37. That's a, a band that's reserved in the U.S. for the search for extraterrestrial intelligence and also for medical telemetry around hospitals. I've tuned my spectrum analyzer to this band frequently. It happens to be 608 to 614 meg. I have yet to hear any aliens on it. But um, if you're not allowed to operate wireless in this band. That's why if you purchase a wireless mic system in the United States, it is not capable of tuning from 608 to 614. If you try it, you'll see that as you tune up in frequency, when you get to 608, the next dial up hops over to 614, and that's because of TV 37. And I wanted to point that out because it will come into play later when we talk about the new regulations for TV band devices. But first, take a quick peek at what... Uh, the difference between the analog and digital carriers are. What you should see here popping up on your screen here in a moment is a radio spectrum analyzer. If you look on the bottom right, you'll see it says 42 megahertz. That's the window that we're looking at, the width of the window or the span of that analyzer, and it's centered around a frequency of 659 meg. You'll see that on your bottom left. So here, if you see, analog and digital TVs are stacked back to back, and there's a complete 42 megahertz of unusable spectrum that we cannot operate any device in, any wireless microphones, intercoms, in-ear monitors, or IFD, or as I said, the FCC term is low-power auxiliary devices. Well, a few years ago, the analog shut down, and digital television now pretty much rules the roost. The thing is, with digital, unlike analog, you can stack, or I should say the FCC allows broadcasters to stack back-to-back -back digital television stations without concern for interference. So if you're in Los Angeles, let's say, trying to operate systems at the Rose Bowl right under Mount Wilson, which is where the television transmits uh, towers are for the L.A. metropolitan area, there are actually 10 back-to-back -back DTV stations, and it gives you a total of a 60-meg spectrum that is completely unusable. So that's something to bear in mind. That was the first hit. Second was losing 698 and above, which was a third of what we've always had since 1962. Now let's take a peek at what the FCC is doing next. And this is a done deal. Uh, as you can see the date on this, this is already freed up spectrum. And what the FCC intends to do, and is already doing this year actually, is they're allowing <clears throat> white space or actually television band devices to energize. This is the first time in the history of man-made radio that we'll have consumer digital devices operating and sharing spectrum with low-power auxiliary devices. So you could very well, in fact, probably will in about a year or so, begin to see these devices, because they'll be smartphones, the portable devices anyway, in your audience, which means that if you have an 
again, I'll say the Rose Bowl because that's one that I'm familiar with. There are 95,000 seats and about 5,000 employees. So even if a fraction of those people have smartphones that could operate in the television band, that means that you'll have tens of thousands, and certainly in even smaller venues, hundreds of potential consumer digital devices within the same spectrum as your wireless microphone systems. So let's take a look at this document. The FCC took steps back in 2010 to free up these airwaves, TV channels, that they were calling at the time white spaces to unleash these new technologies. They called it super Wi-Fi, essentially their digital data links, <clears throat> with the thought that uh, probably within the next year we'll start to see smartphones operating in the same band. Okay, this white space, or what we'll call TV band device spectrum, is considered prime real estate because its signals travel well, making it ideally suited for mobile wireless devices. This is exactly why um, manufacturers began to place wireless microphones and intercoms there because the signals do travel well for a small portable device. They are not white spaces, however, because anyone who's been operating wireless mics or comms for any length of time knows that these spaces between TV stations are exactly where we have been operating since 1962. So they are not white spaces. They're actually very dark, dingy spaces. And as I say, it's getting more and more difficult to make systems operate. So let me just do a quick overview of what this transition has meant for us so far, and then we'll talk about where we're going next as well. So it was June 12th of 2009 where the 698 and above auction happened, and we lost one-third of our spectrum in conjunction with the digital transmit, uh, DTV transmitters firing up, okay? Now what's happening over the next year is that the TV band devices will begin to operate. First fixed location devices, point-to-point -point links probably between business offices and so forth, and then the handset uh, portable phones and smartphones will begin to energize when they hit the market at some point early next year, I'm told. So once that happens, we will be operating in less than 10% of the radio spectrum that we have been using since 1962 in cooperation and coordination with television broadcasters. So if your venue has 50 wireless systems, microphones, comms, in-ear monitors, IFPs, and you've had hundreds of megahertz to operate those in up until now, this coming year you'll have to get that same number of systems to operate in less than one-tenth of the radio spectrum that we've always had. And I, I call it our own, it's really not. It's a TV spectrum that we're authorized to operate in as long as we don't create interference onto the primary uh, licensed person, which would be the television, of course. So we'll talk about some ways to band plan accordingly so that you can navigate around these changes and how to protect your venue. So let's take a look at what these TV BDs, these television band devices, uh, where they're going to operate and what exactly they are. As I said, there are a couple of versions, fixed and portable. Uh, the portables were the ones that we're most concerned with because they'll be right inside of our audience, inside of our church or inside of our theater or in, in a football stadium or wherever you happen to work with your wireless, the fans or your congregation uh, will more than likely have these smartphones, just like now we know many people that have smartphones. You know, kids have smartphones now, so I can only anticipate that professionals will continue to have smartphones, and when they can operate down in our, in our what I'm calling our band, uh, the potential exists that they will create major interference, making our wireless devices unusable, our wireless audio devices unusable. Just like any other smartphone, they'll have a, a, geolic, a geolocation capability, so they know where they are. In fact, I downloaded a white space app for my phone, and I was uh, sitting here right in the room where I'm presenting from right now, and I was able to locate not only that I was in my house, but which room in the house I was in. So the capability is already there, the FCC simply mandating that these, white, these TV band devices must have, must have the same capability. Now, the rules do provide protection for services, including wireless microphones, licensed and unlicensed. However, there, there are some reservations I have about
about how well it will work, and I'll explain what those are and, again, how to get around those staying within all of the current FCC rules. Let's talk about really quickly the difference between uh, licensed and unwireless micro unlicensed wireless microphones. If you take a look, you should be seeing on your screen at the top it says wireless microphone overview. And on the top half of that, you'll see licensed wireless microphones. These are microphones that are part 74, which means they operate within the TV channels that I showed you the list for earlier. But the, the license has to do with the operator. So Part 74 licenses mainly go to broadcasters. Broadcasters work with high power RF all day. They're usually engineers, you know, really nice guys. They're circuit guys and RF guys, and they mostly wear pocket protectors and have a propeller hat. But they're very nice guys, and they help coordinate. We'll talk about the coordinators for the Society of Broadcast Engineers here in a minute. But the fact is that only about 3% of the wireless systems used in the United States are used by broadcasters. The majority, over 95%, are the rest of us that are not licensed broadcasters, but maybe you're trying to work a, a circus a leg show in Vegas or a Broadway theater in New York or, or a football game, like the Rose Bowl or, or NBA All-Stars or any other large event. Also, corporate theater, you could have upwards of 100 wireless systems in a, in a corporate theater environment, and churches as well. So the rest of us really fall under this unlicensed microphone category, and we really need to learn what the TV band device rules are because we are going to have to work around them. If you look at the bottom of the unlicensed wireless microphone paragraph there, you'll see that it says interference protection based on Part 15 rules. In other words, our wireless microphones, intercoms, IFBs, and in-ear monitors, or personal monitors, if you're Marty Garcia from Futuresonics, we are on par with these TV band devices. So that means that if our wireless microphone steps on top of a Part 74 broadcaster, we are obligated to shut down our system. If we get stepped on by a TV band device, no one wins because we are all on par. Those devices are Part 15 unlicensed, and so are we if we do not have a broadcast license. By the way, I should note that even broadcasters should be concerned with what's about to happen here, because I have done more than one occasion as a RF coordinator for a large event, had to shut down consumer devices like um, cell phone repeaters because they were stepping on uh, some component of an event. So these are consumer devices. They're going to be very small. They will not have precision um, parts inside of them. And my guess is that when you put, you know, 40 of them, let alone 40,000 of them, next to each other in the audience, that they will uh, create intermods and splatter onto uh, adjacent channels that are supposed to be reserved for wireless microphones and intercoms. So let's take a peek at exactly what those channels are. And I want to thank um, Ira Kelts from the FCC for, for supplying this information. He was kind enough to let me use this and is very sympathetic with all of American culture that will be affected by the introduction of these consumer devices with very little to no testing. I mean, let's face it, everyone likes to go to a Broadway show and go to church and everywhere else. So just because you work for the FCC, it doesn't mean that you're not concerned with what happens to wireless microphones. In fact, the FCC, as I said, doesn't even implement this. Congress does. Congress passed laws. The FCC are the ones that have to try to make it work without the rest of American culture going haywire. So uh, thank goodness that they took a step back, took a breather, and, and took a closer look. And I have to publicly thank Shure for this, uh, guys like Mar uh, Mark Brunner and Edgar Ryle, who's been going to Washington, D.C., and talking to the FCC and congressional offices, Senate, and spending lots of money. And I dare say that if they didn't start doing that many moons ago, we would not be having this discussion right now because our wireless audio systems probably would have already stopped working. They'd be unusable if this introduction was made without all of the um, time that, that the FCC took to implement this, thanks to companies like Shure that, on behalf of us, the production and worship communities, went to the FCC and uh, said, hey, well, hang on, let's, let's take this a step at a time. So what you're looking at here is the band plan for 
the television band devices. Um, if you see on your screen a television set with a, um, a little blue square in the back, that means there's an active television station in that city. So, for example, here, Channel 5, there's a broadcast station in this city, but that means that on Channel 6, you cannot operate television band devices, the digital devices. And I should point out also that there are two different types of TV band devices, fixed and portable. The portables aren't even allowed to operate below TV channel 21. So the only TV band devices that we'll see down in VHF will be the fixed devices. The good news is that there are a lot of regulations that keep those devices at bay to where we can quickly find an area to stack some wireless microphones, intercoms, IFBs, in your monitors. So on, on this particular graph in this city, if we look at the upper uh, high band VHF, there's a TV channel 7. Well, that little circle with the line through it, behind that it says TVBD. In other words, no TVBDs. So adjacent to TV channel 7, you will not see a fixed or portable, in this case, television band device. What does that mean? That means that's, that's the perfect spot to place your wireless microphones and intercoms. So in the old days, we tried to avoid television carriers uh, to not get interference or to keep the noise floor down. Well, the new, in the new dimension, in the new time here, we really want to specifically look for the six-meg slices next to active television stations because in VHF anyway and up to TV channel 20, those fixed television band devices are not authorized to operate adjacent to any channel. So if you, it's very easy for you to look to see what city you're in, particularly if you're a permanent installation like a surf show in Vegas or like a church, and you're not moving around on tour, you can find out which television stations are active, and you'll know going forward that the uh, six meg slice adjacent to that will be clear to operate wireless microphones. It's, of course, uh, a theoretical assumption. No one would really know until uh, all of this equipment fires up and lights off. You'll also notice, look, TV channel 7 through 13, that there is no adjacent uh, television broadcast station next to channel 9. And that's why there is no uh, TV DV with a, a circle and lines going through it, because in this city at least, uh, the TV channel 9 is open game for these fixed television band devices. Another quick note before I move on here. You'll, let's move up to the UHF, and you can see channel 14, the same thing holds true. Uh, you cannot operate a fixed digital consumer TVBD on channel 15, the adjacent channel to 14. And that same thing holds true all the way up to channel 20. Once we get up above channel 21, above 512 meg, the rules change quite a bit. So you really have to start looking at this future spectrum as VHF up to channel 20, and then UHF above TV21. Because above TV21, above 512 and up to 698 meg, that's where all of the uh, portable devices may operate, the smartphone devices and any other TVBD as well. In fact, the only two 6 meg slices that are reserved for wireless microphone and intercom operation is the first 6 megahertz slice above channel 37 and the first six megahertz slice below TV channel 37, which is 608 to 614. So that means that if you have all UHF equipment currently and it's all above 512 meg, going forward here over the next year, you're going to have to make all of that equipment operate within 12 meg, okay? That's really important to remember is that no longer do we live by the Reader's Digest or the TV Guide. Now we have to plan our spectrum based on where TV band devices are authorized to operate. So we're not just concerned with television, we're also concerned with the television band devices, which could potentially create harmful interference onto, let's say, a life safety backstage comm system, for example. Okay, so let's take a look now at the wireless micro, unlicensed wireless microphone registration, since chances are 95% of you or greater listening to this webinar are unlicensed. Well, even if you are licensed, you should know these regulations because it is a safe haven somewhat for wireless microphones and intercoms. 
First off, there's a couple of part process, and this, this actually does not apply to broadcasters. This applies to the rest of us. Before you can go into a database that the FCC has been appointing these uh, TV band database administrators, before you submit your request, you first have to request permission from the FCC to register in that database. And if you're not, uh, if you're an unlicensed wireless user, they're going to take 30 days and wait for comments to come in for people who can make a case for you not being able to register in that database. I'm assuming that if all goes well, after that 30-day waiting period, then the FCC will allow you, if you follow their other rules, which I'll specify here in a minute, first, I can, if you look at that point number two, the registration must obviously specify the available mic channel only, which means no television band devices, because you're essentially with this asking the database administrator to shut off a bunch of portable uh, TV band devices so that they don't create interference onto your wireless microphones or intercoms. So you have to justify the number, and here's, a, here's an interesting point. This is straight from uh, the FCC's uh, PowerPoint that the IRA allowed me to use here. Read that point number three. Registration must justify the number of TV BD channels requested. It doesn't say TV channels. It says TV BD channels, Okay. That's very important to note that the FCC is saying that those white spaces or TV band device spaces are now TV band BD channels, okay? That kind of tells you where we sit in the overall pecking order. Okay, if you submit that request, by the 30 days go up and no one complains, the FCC will qualify you. And then once you're registered with the FCC, then you are able to go and register with the database administrators and pretty much the, the clincher is the FCC. Once you pass that point, I don't know that database administrators could say no. Before you do so, though, let's take a look at the, the certification process here. You must absolutely specify and certify that you cannot accommodate all of your unlicensed wireless microphones at your venue within the space reserved for wireless microphones. And in at least 13 cities in the United States, all you have are the two six-meg slices, one above and one below TV37. You have to certify that you absolutely cannot put all of your wireless microphones inside of those two channels and then certify that, then request permission from the FCC to uh, register in the white space or TV band device uh, database. Okay? Now, let's take a look. at Here's a website that I, I would uh, hope that you poke around. You might want to write that, that website down there. And I've just been trying to navigate around all of the um, FCC's TVPD info uh, in preparation for today. And I came across this disclaimer, and it kind of got my attention. The overwhelming majority of unlicensed wireless microphone users do not qualify registration for database protection. Registration of unlicensed wireless microphones are available for certain major events and large venues. So that right there is kind of a primer saying that more than likely, and I'm just guessing here, this is a guess, but more than likely we will not be able to get through that 30-day comment period because the FCC is making it fairly clear here that that database protection is reserved for NBA All-Stars and Super Bowls and large events and not for the rest of us who might trying to just be getting a, a service out on Sunday. Okay, so keep that in mind. What that tells me is that you really need to learn the TVBD rules and stay within those, navigate around those, because chances are that's what you have to deal with. So let's take a look at what it does take to register. First off, you have to certify and prove that you have placed at least six frequencies of low-power auxiliary device in the following bands. 76 to 88, which is low band VHF or TV channel 5 and 6, 174 to 216, which is TV channels 7 through 13, 470 to 512, which is TV uh, channels 14 through 20 and is available pretty much anywhere in the country except for the larger, uh, larger cities where public safety operates there, police, fire, and rescue. However, if you do contact your Society of Broadcast Free Coordinator, um, he can probably find you a few holes here and there. Um, the, 
the, the public safety actually doesn't take up the entire six meg of every TV channel in that band, but you really need to go to a qualified source who knows where those specific freaks are, and then they can probably give you two or three meg to operate uh, without creating interference onto, of course, public safety, which is police, fire, and rescue, somebody that we do not want to create interference on, obviously. Other than that, the only two six meg slices or the only other 12 meg to operate in, and how I came up with that number of less than 10%, is the first 6 meg above TV 37 and the first 6 meg below TV 37. And I made a point here to say the more spectrally efficient, the better. Because obviously, the more equipment that you can fit into a 6 meg slice, the less it's, uh, the need to have to go and register with the FCC, or I should say seek permission to register in the database. So while we're talking here about um, um, spectral efficiency, we can take a look at modulation techniques here. There's a couple of different ways that transmitters are modulated, and RF systems in the United States, wireless microphones in particular, and intercoms, um, have operated. They, they all started off on FM, and what you're looking at it on, a, on I should say analog has all been FM. If you look at the top portion of that, those two red waves, what you're looking at on the left is an audio wave. It could be the output of a monitor console feeding it in your monitor. It could be a um, stage manager screaming on his wireless intercom, or it could be Alicia Keys singing on a wireless microphone. What happens is that audio intelligence or information, more accurately, uh, gets married to the RF carrier wave, which you see on your top right. That could be 600 megahertz, for example. And, of course, as you know, the audio is going to be 20 to 20K, so they get married in a component in the transmitter called a modulator. The output of that modulator is called modulated RF. There are a couple of different methods to modulate RF. Uh, the one that's most widely used, in fact, all of the analog wireless systems on the market today uses FM, and what that means is that there's going to be an RF carrier, again, we'll use my example of 600 megahertz, and the transmitter signal, as it becomes to be modulated by someone singing, let's say, the actual frequency moves upwards and downwards. So it occupies more than just the little one slice of 600 meg. It might wiggle all the way down to 599.9 and all the way up to uh, 600.1, let's say. And to accommodate that, when you take into consideration Carlson, Carlson's rule of FM and and the way uh, FM modulation needs to be detected for a good sounding signal, the receivers, FM receivers on the market, require about a 3 to 400 kilohertz footprint. So really you're limited in the number of systems that you can place into one of these 6 meg slices that the FCC has left us with because of the occupied bandwidth of the transmitter and the footprint that the receiver needs to uh, accommodate the information. Another method of transmission or modulation, I should say, is amplitude modulation. It's just like your car radio. There's FM and AM. Amplitude modulation uses the, the amplitude domain and does not wiggle uh, side to side as FM does. When you modulate the transmitter, if you have a razor-sharp 600 megahertz signal, you will not deviate from that 600 megahertz. So you can pack more and more RF into that space because they will not wiggle over into uh, other frequencies. Matter of fact, those of you that operate in your monitors and uh, intercom, wireless that is, probably have noticed you can set up an entire system and everything works great until you begin to modulate the in your monitors. And that audio program confuses wireless intercoms because all of a sudden you're not static, locked on one frequency, you're now wiggling up and down over a, a bunch of frequencies or, or a band of frequencies to accommodate the FM. So if we take a look at what an FM wave looks like, actually on an analyzer, one of those spikes would be our static RF. Pick out one towards right there in the middle, let's say. Okay, if you do not modulate, if you don't sing onto a wireless microphone, the RF carrier on an analyzer will look like one of those spikes. As soon as you begin to sing into that microphone, the very nature of FM causes the RF footprint to increase because the frequency is deviating upwards and downwards around that center carrier. 
So what happens in FM is that you end up taking up more space and limiting the number of transmitters that you can operate. Now, in the past, this wasn't a problem. We can roll a dice and, and pick a few frequencies at random and get a show up and running. Now it's going to take a lot more work, and you're really going to have to understand how these devices work and uh, have proper planning techniques, and that's what we're about to talk right now. However, let me switch gears for a moment. I talked about transmitters. Let's really quickly talk about receivers. Whenever you're setting up a wireless system, you really need to look at the world from the receiver's perspective because physically in space, these, the receiver conditions may be different. For example, if you have a wireless microphone system, first off, you have diversity antennas more than likely. They're probably really great game directional antennas up high, away from lighting walls and so forth. There's probably a finely tuned filter. I hope you're using a finely tuned filter. RF amplifiers and AC powered base station receivers, and that's great. But if you're a wireless helium monitor receiver, you're out in the middle of a stage, probably on a sweaty body, right in front of a video wall that's splattering wideband RF noise all over it. So they're really, when, as you think about the way to set up antenna systems and just frequency coordination, you really need to look at the world from the receiver's perspective. With that said, I'd like to give you one quick trick, and it's a very cheap trick, to uh, increase the performance, particularly going forward, knowing that we only have a couple of little six-meg chunks here to operate in. What you're looking at here are six-meg cavity filters and they literally are so high Q that they block out much of the interference and, in my mind, the potential um, intermods from the um, white space devices that will be energizing over the next year. There are two companies that make those. Um, I don't get uh, any commission. I'm just passing on knowledge at this point, as much information as I can. These are made by Microwave Filter in Syracuse, New York, and then the other company that I'm aware of that makes filters is professional wireless systems out of Orlando. That's a company that I founded back in 94, and they still continue to be at the top end of the manufacturing and support industry. So really think about getting some six-meg filters on all of your base station equipment. The next thing you really need to know is proper RF spectrum band planning, because the name of the game is keeping the noise floor down on your receivers. You have a wireless microphone receiver that's just looking for microvolts of energy, very low levels of RF energy, if you have that within the same frequency bandwidth of all of your in-ear monitors, which are probably radiating watts of power, if you have uh, 16 in-ears going into combiners onto an antenna, well, you have watts of RF power, you certainly don't want to, that to be anywhere near your very sensitive wireless microphones, which are looking for microvolts. So here's a very realistic band plan. Down on the low end, you see 72 to 86 meg, that's um, uh, TV 5 and 6, which you can get Comtech IFBs down there currently, and I'm sure you'll see manufacturers migrating into that area based on the current and future FCC regulations. 174 to 216, again, a very unused band. Um, as an RF coordinator, uh, I can tell you, that the VHF band accounts for probably less than 2% of any event. Um, on the NBA All-Stars, where I worked as a coordinator for a number of years, we had upwards of 500 wireless microphones and intercoms, and less than 2% were VHF. So that's a very attractive uh, place to look for uh, spreading out your wireless to get away from these white uh, TV band devices. You'll also notice I placed some guard bands in here. At the low end of the UHF spectrum for us is 470 meg. Okay, for this particular band plan, I use 470 to 500 meg for low power devices, looking for microvolts of energy. And then I placed a, a couple of meg guard band between that and my in-ear monitors and intercom base stations. And we do that, again, to keep the noise floor down on our very sensitive wireless microphone receivers. Above that, I put 545 to 698, but in effect, you'll only have 6 megahertz to operate in in this band. They'll be somewhere from 4, 545 to 698, and somewhere, whatever you're in your city, is the first available 6 meg slice below TV 37 and the first available 6 meg slice above TV 37. You really need to remember that, and you should implement it immediately because these devices are now authorized to operate. 
This is not future planning anymore. This is it's happening. In addition to RF spectrum band planning, however, there are intermods, uh, which is a mixture of multiple transmitters. And on a typical setup of maybe 50 wireless systems, there could be hundreds of thousands of intermods. Those intermods will be out in space. The trick is don't put any of your wireless mic or intercom receivers on those intermods. So invest in some type of software or find one for free. This one in particular is Professional Wireless's um, IAS software, intermod uh, calculation software. Sure has wireless workbench, and just about every manufacturer has their version. It's, all it is is a math coprocessor, and all it's doing is math for you. And so it, this one happens to be tailored pretty nicely because um, uh, my guy Jason wrote it with me, and we based it on our real-world shows. However, it's just a calculator. So look around for a good Intermod software, and uh, in addition to spectrum band planning, make sure that you um, calculate your Intermods. Let's take a look at um, antenna systems. Uh, again, my gut feeling tells me that going forward, uh, the audiences will be our renegade RF. You know, in the past, we've had to chase around an ENG crew or somebody who fired up some RF uh, within the venue. Now, the very audience, your very congregation, could be the interfering soft, the source for this. So I'm going to recommend that you look into some high-gain uh, antennas that have a very high front-to-back ratio. And what that means is that the antennas will be practically blind behind them. In this case, the uh, helicals have a 30 dB front-to-back ratio, which means that if you're going to get interference from a device behind the antenna, it's going to have to be 30 dB hotter than the device in front of it. And that's a simplification of, of the physics involved. But you get the idea. These are like spotlights, and you want to point them away from your audience because your audience will be the very uh, potential renegade transmission. Another thing that we started to see come on the market recently are digital wireless systems. Um, the footprint for a digital is actually larger than the footprint for an analog FM system. However, they are more tolerant to interference, I've found. AKG has been very good about letting me test their systems on large events, and I tuned an AKG uh, to the same frequency as several FM wireless uh, microphone systems. And the fact of the matter is the slightest bit of interference on an FM carrier is going to cause it to either noise up or drop out prematurely. Um, if it's a wide open receiver with no pilot tone, you'll get noise or some background riz, but it won't be usable, whatever it is. <clears throat> if it's uh, a receiver that operates on signal to noise ratio or has a tone squelch, then it will drop out even though your own microphone has peg bars. So looking forward, maybe not this next year, but maybe two to three years when the smartphones really hit the market they're supposed to start next year, but I'm assuming it'll take time for people to renew and buy a new phone. But in any case, when this happens, another trick would be to find equipment that is more tolerant to interference, and I have found that these digital devices are. Shure also makes a system, the ULXD. I used it on the Country Music Awards, and I thought it was a great system. Of course, Sennheiser makes their version of that same system. I have not had the opportunity to play with it yet at length, and, and really testing something at a trade show isn't the best um, laboratory conditions. really would like to get it into a quiet place or on a show with a little more of a controlled environment so I can uh, listen to it. However, I'm sure that it's up to Sennheiser's standards, which is, of course, top shelf, and this is their Gucci new um, digital 9000 system, so I'm sure it's great. Once I get a chance to listen to it, I'll certainly let everybody know. And I know those of you that already have heard that are probably chuckling that you got to hear it before I did. I know. Very funny. So with this, I would like to um, introduce a new player. Radioactive Designs is a new company that my friends and I have formed. I have a few, a few close friends, a very small group of nice guys that all happen to work uh, and depend on wireless microphones and intercoms for our livelihoods. Uh, three of us were manufacturers. All of us have between 20 and 30 years of experience, and we come from all walks of industry, um, church production, um, theater, sporting
background, special events, award shows, you name it, the, the, the five of us have our hands in a lot, and we depend on wireless microphones and intercoms for our jobs. We took a look at the FCC regulations and what was coming down and sort of tried to do our best to gaze into the crystal ball, and we saw that if someone didn't come out with a piece of equipment to um, allow operation and navigate within these new FCC regulations, that we would have all been out of a job by now. I'm not a mixer. I don't hang PA. I'm not a patch master. I'm not a systems tech. So if wireless microphones stop working, that's it. I'm, I'm out of the audio industry, and I enjoy the audio industry very much, and I would like to see it continue. So the first product that we came up with is a wireless intercom system because we also, most of us, work as RF coordinators at Radioactive Designs, and we know from looking at our coordination list that if you were to add up all of the microphones, in-ear monitors, and IFB systems on a typical event, that that number is equivalent to less than simply the wireless intercom systems. So we thought if we introduce a wireless intercom system or at least start working on it, that that would have the greatest impact on the overall radio spectrum and would help us operate our own wireless microphones and in-ear monitors and IFB because of the fact that intercoms take up more than half of the used wireless spectrum. As you can see, at the current time, this device has not been authorized as required by the rules of the Federal Communications Commission. This device is not and may not be offered for sale or leased until authorized authorization is obtained. However, it is legal for us to uh, display at NAB, and we will be at NAB here next week, and you'll have a chance to play around with the user interface. But let me talk about what we addressed and why we came up with this system, because really we didn't get into this saying we want to be manufacturers. It was kind of out of necessity. So what we did was we looked at the spectral congestion that we all experience as coordinators and operators of our own events, and also the upcoming TVBD introduction, which we know is going to start happening this year and just continue to get worse as the smartphones are introduced in the market. So we pulled out of the UHF band as much as possible. Now, with wireless intercom systems, and if you can notice that that system was, in fact, a six-drop base station. I, I didn't mention that. But the majority of use or frequencies used on a wireless intercom are the packs. In our case, there are six packs to each base. Most of the equipment on the market, there are four packs to each base. But we pulled all those packs out of the UHF spectrum. And we also employ what we're calling enhanced narrow band. It's a form of AM. We're calling it enhanced narrow band. And this modulation that we've used allows us to operate over 150 devices within one 6 meg TV band. Now, I've done some pretty big shows, and the uh, intercom, wireless intercom requirement, frankly, has been insane. And the largest number of packs I've ever had to deal with is about 100. And next to that was about 88 or 90. So if we can actually fit 150 packs within one TV band, that means that we can address pretty much any production, short of like a Super Bowl where you have multiple productions or an NBA All-Stars where you have multiple uh, networks and operators um, inside of the same venue. But short of that, we could certainly accommodate all of the packs required for one particular event or production. Uh, those of you that remember the old days with VHF wireless microphones, there used to be a long 20-inch limp wire antenna, which used to get hung up on everything. Well, we got around that for a couple of reasons. One is we didn't want the limp wire 20-inch antenna hanging down. But more importantly, this magnetic loop, we use an internal narrowband magnetic loop antenna. And I say greater interference protection because a magnetic loop antenna, if you go online and do some research, you'll find that it's got a very tight, high Q. So, in effect, by using a magnetic loop, we've sort of introduced the first level of filtering for our system. So, when a stage manager walks on stage next to a video wall, there'll be only about a one meg wide window. It's not a tracking filter like Sure uses on their UHFR. It's just that by the nature of the physics involved in magnetic loop antennas, um, they are really narrow bands, so they, in effect, offer the first layer of protection. And by doing so, by removing all of the wireless intercom packs, 
out of the UHF band, of course, our final goal was to clear up radio spectrum for wireless microphones and in-ear monitors. So there again, we did this out of necessity, and we've been designing it for many, many years. If you happen to be going to NAB, we hope you'll stop by and see it. Let's talk about the next phase here. This has already been, and by the way, I want to thank uh, Mark Bruner from Shure, who just got back from Washington, D.C., and got the download from the FCC and was kind enough to share this information with me. We haven't even begun to see how TV band devices are going to affect wireless microphones and critical life safety backstage communications yet, and the FCC is already being told by Congress that they have to have another auction, which right now it's, it is on, it's scheduled to happen in tw uh, 2014, although Mark's comment was that it didn't seem likely, it is currently scheduled for 2014. This uh, incentive auctions are meant to free up radio spectrum for more super Wi-Fi devices. That's what the world's all about. Everybody's kid now has a smartphone, and people want more and more spectrum to use these devices and the only spectrum left is what we are using for wireless microphones and intercoms. Now, this next wave of auctions uh, is, is meant, uh, again, uh, a UHF auction. Right now, VHF appears to be a safe haven for at least the short term. And, in fact, the future auctions, according to Mark, it sounds like will be above TV channel 37. So they'll be above 614 meg. Now, if that happens, what, what happens to the 26 meg? Prices that we've had as our protected safe haven that the FCC has just given us. We haven't even had a chance to implement that and see how that's going to work yet, and they're already talking about other options. So please uh, contact Mark. These are, these, he will put you in touch with uh, your, your representative or at least find a way for you to have your voice heard, and don't be afraid because it's now legal for us to operate in this band. We don't have to be broadcasters or have a Part 74 license. The FCC has acknowledged that there are over 2 million wireless systems in the U.S. that represent all of American culture. So please contact Mark. Uh, send him an email. His email is Bruner underscore Mark at Shure.com. So it's Bruner Bravo Romeo Uniform November November Echo Romeo. Bruner underscore Mark at Shure.com. Send him an email, and he'll get back to you and let you know what you can do to take steps so that we don't lose what's left of the bands, particularly since we don't even know if that's going to work yet. Now, with all this additional congestion, I highly recommend that you go out and purchase a some type of spectrum analyzer. This will all have to do with your budget. Uh, the bottom one there, the TTI PSA 1303, I've actually used that on multiple Super Bowls. By the way, I don't coordinate Super Bowl. That's, the NFL has uh, Carl Voss and Ralph Beaver to do that job, but I have to submit my frequencies, when I did it anyway, to the NFL, to Carl. And I used the TTI for many years. It's a precision device. It's not horribly pricey, and I really recommend that everyone go out and look at whatever fits your budget. If you take a look at the just, I have two more here, uh, spectrum analyzers. This represents the low end and a little more of the high end on commercially available analyzers. Um, uh, one of the locals in, in Nashville actually had this RF Explorer on the Country Music Awards, and I found it to be a precise piece of equipment for $250. In fact, I think his was $173. The $250 unit is the more expensive one. If anything else, pick up a unit like that. It, was, it displayed pretty quickly. It, it also saw Wi-Fi if you want to go up to 2.4 gig. And, of course, on the high end, we have Roden Schwartz, which is up there, a little over $8,000, it is a precision piece of equipment, and it has the uh, generator, which will enable you to tune filters and look at uh, cables to see if your cables work. So I'm going to go ahead and close out my portion, but I want to put my contact information up here. Um, that is our new website for radioactive designs, radioactiverf.com. We'll be at NAB booth, NAB booth, Harley 2839. Um, if you'd like to email me, there's my email address on the bottom. I do answer all emails, so please uh, keep in touch. And I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to Keith and see if we have any questions that need to be answered. Well, thank you very much, James. Uh, by the way, we've had several questions about uh, 
the availability of this webinar, and yes, it will be posted, the recording of this webinar will be posted to ProSound Web very soon, uh, I would uh, suspect by tomorrow. Um, I will make it very prominent on the website, so uh, just check back in tomorrow, and uh, you will find a post that should lead you right to it. Um, and if it takes us a bit longer, please just, uh, you know, check back in. But uh, we'll get it uh, up there and available as soon as possible. So uh, we've got only a couple few minutes here for questions. I uh, just wanted to note, too, that any questions that have been submitted that aren't answered now, that aren't addressed now, James will be getting back to you. We archive the questions, provide them to him. So if uh, you've sent in uh, a question or multiple questions, uh, he will get back to you on that if we don't address it here. So anyway, uh, let's go. Uh, oh, first question from um, Don Boomer. Hi, Don. Um, he wanted to know what the name of the uh, White Space app was that you mentioned uh, early on. Yeah, actually, uh, it's from a company called Spectrum Bridge. I was able to download it on an iPhone. Um, I, I spoke to my um, my friends at Microsoft R&D, they were not aware of a program for the Windows 8 phone. However, you can contact um, Spectrum Bridge. I, I did. I had not heard back from the gentleman, Peter, that I emailed, so I don't know if they're planning on developing one for the Windows 8 phone. However, uh, if you just go to iPhone apps and um, punch in white space, there's only one, and it's great, and that's the one that I told you was able to find me in my office, in my home, and it also gives you a useful list of where you can operate wireless microphones because it's really a TV white, it's a really a TV um, band device app. So it's designed to tell you where you can program TV BDs. But that is our new future now. So we need to work around these TV BDs. So we need to use a TV BD app to find out where we can put our microphones. So it's a white space app on the iPhone. All righty. Excellent. Uh, I've got a question from uh, Frank Ward, and he was wondering about the sidebands above and below the AM signal. Yeah, he's referring probably to upper sideband and lower sideband. Um, these would be out-of-band signals. However, if you keep things tight enough, you can make that out-of-band signal or pilot carrier still within a 20 to 25 kilohertz space, and that will enable you to pack probably 10 to 12 times the number of wireless in the same spectrum as an FM system. Mm -hmm. All righty. And uh, here's a question from uh, Brad Harris. Uh, in your webinar two years ago, you mentioned during your wargaming practice to align the squelch of the RF. What is, what are your thoughts on an acceptable noise floor before you start changing frequencies? That's a good question. Uh, the noise floor changes venue to venue, so it's really dependent upon where you're at. If you're at uh, Joe Robbie or Dolphin Stadium or whatever it's called now, you're a mile away from all of the TV transmitters for Miami and Fort Lauderdale, well, you're going to have to raise your squelches a lot higher than you would if you were out in Lincoln, Nebraska, let's say. So the way to think about squelch is look at your noise floor. The receiver will always give you an RF level indication so with your transmitter off, you want to set your squelch above that receiver noise floor. And the other part of the question was, when would I ch change frequencies? Well, I would change frequencies when that squelch threshold is so high that I'm dropping out prematurely. Because when you raise your squelch, you may as well have a dial pointed the other way that says range. Raising squelch is just like turning up uh, an RF noise gate where it won't turn on until a certain audio level, I'm sorry, audio noise gate. It won't turn on to a certain uh, audio level. Well, the same with RF. It's just a gate for RF. So you want to be able to walk your room in operational area, stage, wherever you, whatever your venue is, football field, and set your squelch really as high as you possibly can and still get the range you need. That will keep your systems quiet. All righty, James. Well, thank you very much. It looks like we're uh, running up against the clock, so we're going to need to wind down now. Again, as I mentioned, this will be uh, webinar will be posted and available probably within the next 24 hours via Proton Web. James's um, email address is uh, on the slide we're viewing now. Feel free to contact him 
with questions, and he submitted questions here to this webinar that we haven't addressed. James will uh, follow up on those. So I'd like to thank you all very much uh, for being here. There were uh, approximately at least 250 of you uh, participating at uh, one point, and it's still very strong. And uh, thank you very much. And also thanks so much to James uh, for his presentation. And if you're at the NAB show uh, next week, be sure to look him up. Thanks, Keith.